first glance, uh, Snapchat and The Economist don't seem uh, to be um, the perfect stablemates. Uh, turns out, uh, actually, they are. And to tell us how that might have happened, um, please welcome the Snapchat editor and deputy multimedia editor from The Economist in the USA, Lucy Raw. Lucy. Thank you, Mike. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here this afternoon with me. I hope everyone's still got a little bit of energy post-lunch. I believe you've only got another hour, if that, of talks. I will try and keep this snappy, true to form. So, a big existential question facing newsrooms around the world and legacy publishers like The Economist is one that's been discussed all the time, but in the last few days in particular. How do we make ourselves relevant for younger audiences? This is a question that I've spent the past 18 months thinking about a lot as a Snapchat editor at The Economist. It kind of comes with the territory. Today, I'm going to talk about our adventures on that platform. Some of the learnings, because we're still learning a lot, and whether so far we think that that experiment is paying off. But first, a little bit about me and The Economist. So, I'm Australian, in case you can't tell. I haven't lived in Australia for many years. I've been a journalist at The Economist for the past 10. So I've always been on the editorial side of things at The Economist. And I've always been on the audio and visual side of things. So asking what we might sound or look or feel like on a different platform is something that I've been thinking about in one way or another for quite some time. What about The Economist? I'm sure most of you have heard of The Economist. We were founded in 1843 in response to the Corn Laws by a British businessman called James Wilson. He was all about free trade. And if you fast forward to today, you can actually see I've included a cover from a recent edition of The Economist featuring Donald Trump's face on a hand grenade. We're still, thankfully, an advocate for free trade, maybe at a time where more advocates for free trade are needed. We're 175 years old. We turn 175 this September. A lot has also changed. These days, we have a global weekly circulation of 1.5 million. We're still English only, but we have unofficial translations in a couple of other languages as well. We've expanded our coverage beyond economics, finance, and business to include a science section and a culture section. And just on the foreign affairs, in the 1940s, we added a US section, and in 2013, a China section. We're independent editorially, and mercifully, we remain profitable in the current climate. We're not dependent on advertising revenue to make money. Instead, we have what we think is a sustainable business model based on subscription revenue from our readers. The majority of those subscriptions come from print publishers, but there are also plenty of digital subscribers as well. So that's a little bit about us. But what makes The Economist The Economist? If you put our DNA under a microscope, what would you find? And this is something I'm going to come back to quite a bit today. Because as a publisher, we try and work out what bits of our voice translate best for new platforms and products. It's really important for us to understand what our core values are. So just quickly, five things. We're a trusted, finishable filter on the news. If you only could take one thing to a desert island to read, we would like it to be The Economist. By the time you finished it, and people do finish it, believe it or not, it's intended to be finished, you should have been brought completely up to date on the stories that we think matter in that given week. We're a smart guide to forces shaping the future. Week in, week out, we're writing about AI and business, driverless cars, and we're not just writing about the technological change or the scientific discovery. We're talking about the impact that that's going to have on future generations. We remain 
175 years later, a staunch advocate for liberal progressive causes. In the 80s, we were early and loud on gay marriage and also on the legalization of drugs. More recently, we've campaigned for the right to die. And we're global, not national. So yes, we cover domestic news stories, but we cover them from an international perspective. We have a network of people around the world who are reporting for us. Last but not least, and I'll go back to the last slide here. I don't know if you can see George Bush Sr. with a copy of The Economist tucked under his arm. We've been read by every single American president since JFK. I'm not sure about Donald Trump. I don't want to speculate. But we're high quality journalism for people who are willing to pay for it. So those are the five core values that we see as defining us. Fine. So how does that translate when it comes to us making digital products and getting up on new digital platforms? The first thing to stress is that having that core DNA embedded in all our efforts is essential. If it's not there, we're not representing The Economist. We're not reflecting who we are, and that's what's valuable in our mind. We also ask ourselves a couple of questions. First, will it enhance the value of the package? Is this going to add value to my mother, Helen Raw's subscription? She's been a long-term subscriber to The Economist. Would a daily podcast, if she knew how to access one, um, help her enjoy the content more? Can it introduce new subscribers? People who've never heard about The Economist, who aren't looking at newsstands, who are getting their news and their information from different channels? Or ideally, can it do both? Really quickly, I'll skip through a couple of examples of digital products, and then I'll get to the main event, which is Snapchat. First, Espresso, our daily app. Has anyone got Espresso here? OK, great. So you guys know what it is. It's a concentrated shot of daily analysis, kind of what we do on a weekly basis, but delivered every day. Espresso is a trusted, finishable news filter. Remember that first of our core values. It's forward-looking. We're not just talking about the news that's happening that day. We might be looking forward to a story that's happening later on in that week. It's global. And it's a paid product, free to our subscribers, but we also have tens of thousands of Espresso-only subscribers. Since it was founded in 2014, late uh, 2014, Espresso has performed very well. It makes us a little bit of money, which is great, but it's also won lots of awards. The second product is one that is close to my heart. You might have heard of Espresso, but I doubt anyone in this room has heard of certain ideas of Europe. If you have, you deserve a gold medal. That was the podcast I started <laughs> working at The Economist as an editor on 10 years ago, back in 2008. Back then, we made two audio podcasts a week. These days, we make five a week, and we reach an audience of six million listeners a month. So our audio offering has expanded significantly. Guess what? Again, those same shared values are going to crop up. Our radio is a trusted filter on the news. Our journalists are selecting topics, and then they're playing the same kind of global analysis that they would apply to anything that they were writing in the paper, on the website. We don't differentiate. It's succinct, and it's finishable. Our podcasts are tightly edited. Believe me, I've spent many hours of my life crunching our journalists down to make them sound good and easily digestible in 10 to 20 minutes. It's free, so unlike Espresso, which is a paid product, we put this out, and the reason that, one of the reasons that it's free is because we see this really as a, a great tool for reaching new audiences. We think audio is a good fit for The Economist. We see it as a shop window for our global analytical approach. And, horrible pun, stay tuned, because in the coming months, we will be expanding our audio offering still further. But anyway, 
a tool for reach. That's really what I'm here to talk about a bit more today. So without further ado, Snapchat. Evan Spiegel invited The Economist to join the Snapchat Discover platform back in January of 2016. And I'll admit, when I heard that we were contemplating joining Discover, I had a reaction which I think is summed up by the German word, Jein. Uh, yeah, but nine. I mean, yes, I, I can kind of understand it, but no, really. I mean, The Economist, we are weighty, we are a big read, we're an important read. Since when are teenagers interested in credit default swaps, really? And actually, before I, I go any further, let me just clarify something. I'm sure most of you know this already, but when I talk about Snapchat Discover, I'm talking about the bit of the platform that is news and entertainment. I'm not talking about the visual messaging app, the part where you can put a filter over somebody's face. I'm talking about what you can see up here right now. And you can see that we keep some interesting company. There's over 40 publishers up on Snapchat Discover, among them the New York Times, Mashable, Daily Mail, Taste Made. I think actually that the Bleacher Report may be up on Snapchat as well, but I'm not sure. So, this is the bit of the platform where we're telling stories, where we're delivering news and entertainment. At the time that we launched on Discover, which was back in October 2016, the audience for Snapchat was vast and young. It's still pretty young. I mean, it has trended a little older, but when I say a little older, I'm talking five years above the age of 24. Our bread and butter remain 14 to 17-year-olds on the platform. So just think about that, The Economist talking to 14 to 17-year-olds. These days, the whole platform has 187 active daily users, and they're a very engaged community, a lot of them spending up to half an hour a day on the app itself. Right, so that's Snapchat Discover. Back to the challenge that I was faced with, which was how on earth do I translate The Economist for this platform? What bits of our voice, our editorial voice, our very specific editorial voice would work? And let me just make something extremely clear. A lot of people who know The Economist and are familiar with Snapchat tend to assume that in order for us to be on that platform, we need to dumb ourselves down or crunch down our analysis to a point where it's so condensed that it just doesn't make sense. This is erroneous. To underestimate the intellect of a younger audience and their discernment is a real mistake. I think that you're probably overestimating our intelligence and discernment at the same time as that. It turns out, in this vast, vast audience that Snapchat has, that there is a segment of it that is globally curious. And don't forget, that's who The Economist is writing for, or podcasting for, or putting espresso together for every other day. So we are not dumbing things down here. Anyone who knows uh, a teenager, remembers being a teenager themselves, also knows that teenagers know everything. Anyway, one of the first challenges was to work out how we could condense ourselves. Well, it turns out, remember that core value that we've already discussed? The Economist is already succinctly curated content. The whole idea behind a Discover Edition, and I'll get to some samples of these in a moment, is to provide a comprehensive, complete, and pithy journalism experience. Snaps, which are 10-second loopable video, they can feature animation, text, visuals of any number of descriptions, and swipe-up articles are intended to be a finishable product, so bingo, already a good fit. 
Pretty early on in the um, proof of concept phase, we decided that we were probably best served on the platform by doing deep dives into single topics. Rather than trying to cover a whole variety of different stories, we thought, let's make our editions based on a single theme or topic. Let's make them these mega explainers. Let's provide this audience with the toolkit, the vocabulary, the context that they need to understand the rest of our journalism. So you'll see with our editions that, and this is something that Snapchat also encourage, they tend to be heavy on the end. We have a lot more swipe ups to articles once we've already given them the key information they need to be able to understand what's going on in some of those articles. Think of them as the ultimate cheat sheet. The other area where our values align really well with this, organize, uh, with this audience, sorry, well, actually, there's two. As a guide to the future and as an advocate for liberal progressive causes. Let's talk briefly about the first one. Obviously, The Economist is writing about the future all the time. And this is where we had a little bit more of a challenge in adapting our content for the platform. I'll give you an example. About a year or so back, we put together an edition on the Arctic, and that ran under the cover banner of something like the death of the Arctic. Really interesting bit of journalism, lots of cool reporting from the Arctic Circle, lots of science, lots of human characters. Really important, and a topic that we thought would do really well with the Snapchat audience. The thing is, the way that we would present that in the magazine is going to be quite different to the way that we will arrest the curiosity of a younger audience and get them through the door and be able to sustain their attention till we can deliver some of that meteor economist analysis that most of you probably associate us with. So we kicked off the edition with a snap of the biggest glacier calving ever recorded on film. Glacier calving, it's collapsing into the ocean. It was a, a chunk of ice the size of Manhattan. And we superimposed an image of a map of Manhattan onto this. The next snap we said, do you know how many bits of Manhattan are going to be underwater by the time that you're 70? And then the next snap, we gave the audience a map with those bits shaded in. I don't know if anyone knows uh, which bits of Manhattan are going to be underwater uh, by the time that uh, the Snapchat cohort uh, in their 70s, but put it this way, JFK isn't around for much longer. So we want to show how this is going to impact this audience, and we want to show and not tell. And, and this isn't rocket science. This is just journalism 101. The economists should be doing this in the first place anyway. One of the nicest bits of feedback I've had internally about our efforts on the platform came from the international editor who had originally worked on that package. She said, Lucy, that's exactly how we should be framing things more often. So again, economist DNA, the economist reporting, but we're thinking about how we can present it in a way we're still using our smarts, we're still using the depth of our analysis, but how can we present it in a way that feels relevant to this audience? Something that Melissa Rosenthal talked about yesterday. Right, uh, I'll skip through this, sorry, I, I realize I'm, I've run out of time. But anyway, as an advocate for the future and for progressive liberal causes, clearly there are some things that we're going to agree with the Snapchat generation on, the uh, abolition of capital punishment, uh, legalization of drugs, decriminalization of prostitution, just to mention three. We had a lot of coverage, which we knew would be a good fit that would sustain those additions for us. Let me skip through this quickly so I can actually get to showing you what this actually looks like when it comes to life. Global perspective. Most publishers up on the platform are doing makeup tips and the Kardashians. We were not afraid to cover big global stories that we thought should be on these young people's radars. Um, just quickly before I show you what it all looks like, just like we had to come up with uh, an editorial, we had to update our editorial language for this platform, we also had to think about our, our visual language. The Economist has a very established visual identity, and we wanted to make sure that whoever hit our edition instantly knew that it was The Economist, but we also wanted them to know that it, it felt like it was on platform. 
we came up with an approach which we describe as bold, elegant, and playful. Again, these are adjectives that could apply to any part of The Economist's core editorial offering. So, this is the edition that we launched with. I apologize that there's no sound. And I'm, I'm not going to play the, the full edition. This is just to get you a sense of, give you a sense of how it all comes together. This is a screen grab from my phone, so it's a little bumpy. So first, we're creating buy-in, posing some big, scary questions, then a fact sheet, the state of unemployed and underemployed in Europe and America. Again, a big question. We come to a swipe up. And I hope you get a sense of the kind of um, things that we're doing with animation and with design. So this is the edition that we launched with back in October of 2016. And it's, again, it's The Economist's DNA. I mean, talking about the future of jobs is something that we do every other week in the paper. We're not just talking about the technological change, we're talking about the social consequences that this might have. You can see there's a lot of original animation, and there's a lot of original reporting that goes into these editions as well. Okay, I'm going to skip through because I'm already like way over time and there's this big red flashing light there. So forgive me. Um, this is another edition that I want to show you very briefly because this was one of the editions that we did on campaigning. You'll see that there, there are similarities, big clean graphics, establishing context, showing, not telling. We began this edition with the latest update of the story, which was legalization of pot in Cal uh, Colorado. And then we gave that historical con um, context. We rewound back and we gave this audience useful vocabulary and a bit of a history lesson so that they could really understand why the war on drugs failed. And I wish I could skip through this for you, but unfortunately, I can't. If anyone's interested in seeing these editions, just let me know, and I'm more than happy to share them with you. You can also find us on Discover right now. Right, last edition that I'm going to show you, just because I'm so over time. This is uh, one of my favorite editions that we've done. It was on North Korea. And this is really captures what we do best on Snapchat, in my opinion, and what The Economist does best. We published this way back in October 2016, when North Korea wasn't on everybody's radars. And one of the things that The Economist magazine does week in, week out, is it says, you might have stopped paying attention to this, but it still matters. You're all looking over here, but this still matters. And we really hit the nail on the head with this edition because it was before it really blew up. We provided the full toolkit, bio, history, so that when things in North Korea did take off, the audience knew what to expect, knew what was going on. This is what The Economist does in its pages, in its podcasts. Again, this is a timeline of the conflict everywhere. Right. This is our team. Um, the way that we put these editions together is, the, the thing that takes the most time is working out what topics are going to be a good fit. This is our designer, Dimitri, and me, and the other members of our team. We're a small team, and we're a pretty nimble one. Um, the one thing to say about our process is, just like all the rest of our economist journalism, it's fact-checked, right? So, something to stress, especially in the, the current climate. How have people responded to us on the platform? So it's a little hard to read this, but I'll just quickly pick out a couple of comments. I recently subscribed to The Economist on Snapchat. It's 20,000 times more lit than one could ever expect. <laughs> the Economist has a channel, and that alone is blowing my mind. The Economist is now on Snapchat, and my life has been made. Note, these are all women. Um, the Economist tends to be to more popular, sure thing, with, yeah. with um, a male audience. One of the exciting things for us on Discover is that it trends heavily female, so we're able to not just put ourselves in front of a young audience, but a female one as well. Right, so the results so far of our, the big banner results of our Snapchat experiment. It has led to the single biggest step change in our readership history since we were founded in 1843. Uh, 
you know, being able to put our journalism in front of a, pla a, a vast audience who are this age is extremely exciting for us. Um, we get 7.1 million uniques through the door every month, which is a big number for us. We've won multiple awards. It's provided an update to our image. I think people tend to think of us, if they know of us, as being stuffy or old-fashioned, but now we're on Snapchat. And if you don't know us, check us out. We don't just write about economics. Turns out that we write about a whole range of stuff as well. It makes some money, which is terrific news as far as we're concerned. One way you could see it is marketing, essentially, that is sponsored by ad revenue. And last and most important, it's proof that we can engage with a younger audience on a different platform. Platforms come and go, right? We don't know what's happening there. But the one thing we do know is this shift in short form visual journalism is here to stay. I'm thrilled that The Economist is investing in it and we're learning a heck of a lot as we go. And this is our founder, James Wilson, vomiting a rainbow. So The Economist on Snapchat, yes, really. Thank you. Lucy, thank you. Sorry. That's all right. I'm so sorry. No time for questions, though, I'm afraid. But oh, thank you, Lucy. Fine. That's thank fine. you. Cheers.